what is going on everybody how is everybody doing today welcome back here today to another episode of the just fall on podcast we're on installment number six here and i'm excited to be bringing you a reaction to espn's new 2024 mock draft so a little bit of a different setup than usual i'm not gonna be in my chair with the typical podcast setup behind me because i'm gonna be going through this on my computer with you guys reacting to this mock draft in a whole. I did do a YouTube video on this on the Sorrell channel, but I thought it would be fun to kind of break down each single pick in a longer form and we can kind of dive into the stats, the fits, would I like this for this team or not. So I mentioned this in the video. I don't have currently an ESPN Plus um, subscription. I was going to get one to read it, but then um, on3.com posted this as well. So I'm just going to go off this because it's free. Like I said, in that video, you can call me cheap for this, but I, I'm going to save the eight bucks this month. So um, I'm excited to react to this. If you guys um, are watching this, you'll kind of get a little bit better of a visual, um, I guess, representation of what I'm talking about. But I will obviously do this well enough where if you're listening on podcasts or Apple, Spotify, you won't be missing too much because I'm going to read out basically everything that I currently see on my computer screen. If you guys are enjoying these, I would appreciate you dropping a thumbs up for sure. And let me know in the comments what you guys think. If you guys like the draft content, as well as kind of what's going on with the NBA with the second half, kind of getting back into the full swing of things. For the next episode, you guys will probably see me do my reaction to my top 20 list for 2029, just trying to predict those players as well. So that'll be back in kind of the podcast uh, setup where I'm going to be like kind of on my chair and everything like that with the, the background behind me. So yeah, I'm excited to kind of get into this. Um, but the college season getting close to tournament play at least conference wise like we're going to be getting into that in under two three-ish weeks right now like we're basically three weeks um kind of getting there three four-ish weeks from selection sunday and march madden is starting and then obviously college season's done we'll know everything we know about these prospects what they did in their collegiate careers or obviously with some other guys playing international play and then that's going to ramp up in the 2024 draft with the lottery being in May, then we'll know where each team is picking. So um, we'll start this off. Um, this is the draft order of what ESPN's model prediction had the end of the season standings being. So they actually had the Washington Wizards finishing with the worst record in the NBA, and they're going to be picking number one in this. Uh, they opt for Zachary Reese who... I think has definitely been a riser over the last couple of weeks. I think he was always pretty much a consensus top 10 guy throughout most of his season um, with JL Ber uh, Borg this year in France. And then over the last couple of weeks has really been emerging, um, becoming the number one option um, in this draft. And I think Risa Shea has the ability to be a very good complimentary piece. I don't think he's ever going to have the aggressiveness or maybe the shot creativity to be a number one option in the NBA. I don't even know about a number two option, but I think a lot of people uh, will throw out the comparison, and I see it too, is like a Michael Porter Jr. to an extent. So um, somebody that's going to be very efficient um, overall from the field, at the rim, from three. Like I said, not be super aggressive, but could really benefit playing alongside a true playmaking point guard. That's why I think he'd be a perfect fit in Detroit or Charlotte playing with Cade Cunningham or Lamella Ball. I wonder how good of a fit he would be in San Antonio if they still don't have their point guard next year. Washington will not have their point guard next year. Denny of Dia, though, is a solid playmaker. I don't know if they would ever experiment with like point Denny next year. I think um, he could definitely play next to Ball Cool Bali. And I guess that's what the Wizards have to figure out because um, they have a hole at the center spot since they moved Gafford at the deadline. And will Risache be good enough of a, a piece next to, like adjacent to, Denny of Dia and Bilal Koulibaly? Now, that could be pretty fun, like switchability, because they have a lot of versatility and size. It's cool that they're all international prospects, too, with um, uh, Bilal also being from France and Denny being from Israel. It would be fun, and obviously for the modern game, that's kind of the way it's going. So I don't hate it. The Wizards um, could also get another first-round pick in the draft as well, and they could look to maybe target a point guard. Um, they could look to bring back Tyus Jones. I mean, they might as well overpay for Tyus Jones. Um, say you gave him a little bit more than he's making currently. Say he's making $15 million a year. It's still a tradable contract. He's still a good enough point guard, um, but I wonder if they would maybe be in the market for maybe another point guard in free agency um, or if there's somebody that enters uh, the trade market as well. So Reese Ache going number one to the Wizards. I don't know if I would do that though. If I was, if I had the pick, I still think I would go with Alex Saar number one overall. But I think it's like more of a one A one B, not a full on one, full on two. And that's I think the beauty of this draft class as well is there's guys that are projected to go all over the place. Nobody really has the same mock, and nobody really has the same big board, which is definitely the best. Like last year, everybody had a variation of Wemby at the top, uh, Brandon Miller and Scoot two and three. And mainly the Thompson Twins 4 and 5. There was a little Jairus Walker, a little Taylor Hendricks love in there as well. But um, there was a lot of, 
I guess, cohesiveness with everybody's big board. So I'm excited that this year um, it's going to be all over the place. And we can kind of see who maybe can get bragging rights and who can kind of like, I guess, hype themselves up a couple years down the line from this draft. So number two, Pistons take Alex Saar. It's a weird fit because I think Saar is going to take a little bit of time to develop at the NBA level. Um, just because he's currently not playing a ton in the NBL because he's currently playing behind an all NBA caliber uh, big man over there. So he's not really asked to be the starter. He's coming off the bench, but he's been efficient enough when he's playing. And I think he has a potential to be a stretch for. I think he's going to be an elite rim protector though in the NBA. So that's what you're kind of drafting him for. The fit next to Jalen Duran is weird. And you definitely can't play him, Stewart, and Duran all out there at the same time. So this would kind of make I guess Stewart on the block again in the offseason if they would look for a more shot creator for him, in which they could definitely find. Um, I, maybe not as much now with all the stuff uh, with Drew Eubanks. He's got, I think it suspended three games for that for any uh, the assault charge got dropped. But kind of crazy stuff there. Sar, though, is going to be a project play. I love him with Cade Cunningham, and I think he could definitely benefit from like a pick and roll maestro like Cade and having him as being like the number one point guard playing next to um, and probably would work out a little bit better than being in Washington. So maybe this is a perfect one-two fit for Risa Shea in Washington and Saar in Detroit because Saar fits perfectly with Kate, obviously, but would him and Duran fit well? Would they run into like maybe what the Cavs have with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen? I know some people do compare Saar a little bit to Mobley um, based off like projections of what we could eventually see. So I would still take Saar number one overall. I think if I'm the Wizards, I would probably still do that at the end of the day, but I, I really like Saar to Detroit. And I wonder... If I had to go, like, who has a higher ceiling right now, Jalen Dern or Saar? I still think I would go Alexander Saar, but Jalen Dern most definitely had a higher floor coming out of Memphis. So those are the first two picks, two international guys. Um, I know, like, I'll ask you guys on some community tabs or on Twitter, um, and people are, like, diehard fans or big NBA fans are like, this is the first draft that I know none of these prospects. Because a lot of the guys at least talked about in the top five three of them are international guys two of them are g league guys so um it, it's like kind of similar to last year as well because we had the thompson twins in the overtime elite we had uh scoot in the g league ignite we had Bilal and uh wemby playing for metropolitan's 92 so it's kind of another similar draft from that but next year's uh draft should be more college prospects which will be exciting unless some guys do end up decommitting from College, similar to like what Ron Holland did from Texas this year and go the G League Ignite route. So next up, we have Rob Dillingham, number three to Kentucky. Uh, this is for kind of the YouTube folks. I can kind of throw up some college basketball reference just so you can kind of give a basis of what his stats have been so far um, this year. Um, so he's averaging 15 points, 48% from the field, 44% from three. He's currently playing for the Kentucky Wildcats, who have an incredible deep roster. There was a point this season where we thought Kentucky could have five to six first rounders with Reed Shepard, who we'll get to, Justin Edwards, who should definitely stay another year at Kentucky, Zavonimir uh, Ivici who could probably also benefit staying another year, but could also probably get drafted. Um, DJ Wagner, who's been very disappointing this year, should probably also stay another year. Um, they also have Aaron Bradshaw, Antonio Reeves, who can probably go in the mid to late second. Uh, there's a ton of talent at Kentucky this year for sure. And Dillingham is coming off the bench. It seems more political why he's not starting because Wagner was a highly uh, higher touted uh, high school prospect. And people are saying the reason why uh, Dillingham still comes off the bench is because they promised DJ Wagner to be a starter at Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky's definitely been underwhelming this year, and it seems like they really have, uh, and they're kind of riding the coattails off of the Carl Anthony Towns championship. Because um, I feel like Kentucky has just been disappointing, disappointing each year, and they've had arguably a top five um, deepest college roster. But Dillingham has been an incredible score. He went off against LSU um, in that second half. Um, last night of when I'm recording this, they did lose in that game. Um, and I think Dillingham should most definitely be a top pick in this draft. And I don't know how high I would take him. I've always been a fan of Dillingham. I think I was on the Dillingham bandwagon before it really started getting overwhelming. Um, three is a little rich for me for San Antonio. I still think I would opt for Nikola Topic because I think this pick, what you're also doing is you're prioritizing Wemby's development with this pick. And I do think that would tend to be more towards Nikola Topic as a playmaker and somebody that can at least not be a complete liability on the defensive side of the ball because the one weakness or downside that people see in Dillingham's game does not show up in the box score it's his defense because he's a little bit of an undersized guard and will he be um, able to guard some of the quicker guys at the NBA level that'll be a big question mark for him but his offense is definitely third overall pick worthy um, for somebody that's also one of the best shooters in this draft as well um, so this pick I guess um, I did not like this Matas Buzelis going to the Hornets at number four. Buzelis obviously is going to be very appealing because he is 6'10 um, as a forward who likes to shoot the ball. I'm not going to say he's a specifically a good shooter because um, he's been 
below 30% from three for the G League Ignite this season. He's not been a good free throw shooter. It's not looked pretty times as well. Um, and it does seem like he's not feeling like, I think, cohesive into the G League Ignite offense, which has a ton of flaws this year, this year for sure. So I don't know how I feel about Charlotte taking him at four. I think there's some better options. I think if you wanted to go wing and you wanted to go complimentary um, to Brandon Miller, Cody Williams is on this board, who I think will be a better shooter than Buzelis. But I guess Gavoni of ESPN is projecting Buzelis to maybe not be good right away, but get eventually molded into his body at 6'10 and develop an outside jumper. And that could be very appealing because this guy could eventually be um, a shooting guard at 6'10", theoretically, because he's very athletic for somebody of his size. Um, so I see the appeal. I would probably opt for Cody Williams. I don't think I would take... Buzelis, uh, Buzelis, excuse me, over Ron Holland, his G League Ignite teammate, just because of how good of a defender Ron Holland is. Um, and I think that's very valuable. But I wouldn't also be surprised if Chicago tried trading out of this pick for more, I guess, like um, proven talent in this league as well. Um, so next up at number five, uh, Cody Williams to the Portland Trailblazers. I like this pick for them. Um, I think I would... I mean, I kind of like Ron Holland, the idea of him in Portland, just because of defense. And Cody Williams could get a little redundant of what they're rolling because I wonder how Cody Williams will be under Chauncey Billups if he is the head coach next year. Uh, Cody has been a phenomenal three-point shooter this year. Um, he is shooting, I believe it's 47% as I'm going to pull it up right now for Colorado. Uh, he was kind of a shaky shooter in high school, obviously the younger brother of Jalen Williams. Uh, he's shooting 47% from three this season, but it's not on a, a lot of attempts. It's on two attempts a night. And sometimes you feel like he passes up some decent shots that he should take just to preserve his three-point percentage, obviously, which you don't want to see. And 47% is not sustainable. He's a 70% free throw shooter. So you would expect that to go down for sure at the NBA level. But if he could be north of 35%, that's valuable. He's 59% from the field. He's a very good slash driver he does need to work on his handle i feel like when he's trying to get through defenders to get to the rim because it seems like it gets like a, a little like bobbly and the ball will juggle in his hands and that's obviously he's gonna get his pocket stolen a ton at the nba level if he doesn't work on that there are some concerns with him uh, i feel like also with his size and frame and how strong he'll be at the next level but i think what this draft is going to be is the huge it's like it's gonna be the complimentary draft these are all gonna be complimentary pieces i don't think any of these guys maybe very few of them will be a number two option or maybe a number one option on a very good team. I highly doubt that. And I think Cody Williams would be a very good spot up shooter, maybe just somebody that could be a nice like slasher cutter off ball player to uh, the primary ball handlers there in Portland next year, which will be uh, Anthony Simons, Scoot Henderson, and Shaden Sharp. And I think that's what Williams can become. I like this pick for them. I'm a, I'm a fan of Cody Williams. He's my number one college player still right now. And still have him higher than Dillingham. Uh, so at number six, uh, Gavoni has the Raptors taking Nikola Topic. Love this. This is the pick I would think about the Spurs at three, uh, just because he's a bigger point guard. He's 6'6", 200. He's somebody that definitely has more defensive potential and upside than Rob Dillingham. And that's definitely something Toronto was trying to kind of figure out going forward. I mean, quickly, I think it's an underrated defender. Scotty Barnes is a good defender. Um, and we'll see what they go with next year, what that team is going to look like, because it could be all over the place. Will Jakobert will be the starting center. Um, RJ Barrett's obviously going to be there with his contract. Would they bring back Bruce Brown? Would he end up getting traded? How involved will Grady Dick be next year? But Topic is somebody that can help further along Scotty Barnes' development as a number one. He's not going to take the ball out of his hands offensively. He's going to be able to set up Scotty Barnes and be arguably the best facilitator in this draft. And that's what Topic's uh, vision has shown um, in Serbia and eventually in the EuroLeague, hopefully when he's fully healthy again, up and running. So I, I love Topic as a top five player in this class. And I think six was incredible value the way this mock has fallen. Uh, seven, we have the Memphis uh, Grizzlies. They're taking Jacoby Walter. I'm not a huge fan of Walter in Memphis. Um, he's a streaky guy nonetheless. Uh, he's been a little bit um, more inefficient as of late since kind of Big 12 play has started for Baylor. And he's the top option on the team. Uh, and sometimes for like Cody Williams, going back to him for Colorado, he's like a third scoring option at times, especially when it's crunch time. Walter's acts like as a number one or number two. Um, and for Walter specifically, for him to maybe be seventh overall in the draft is a little bit interesting. Um, I know he's got top 10 potential and his good free throw percentage, I, I think in like the jumper looks pretty, can be able uh, to be transferable to a good efficiency at the NBA level. So I think we could definitely see that from Jacoby Walter. I just wonder how the efficiencies will work. 
would he fit in Memphis? Because I think that was the big gripe I had with this when I made the video. Was like, I don't think Walter's more of a complimentary piece. I think he's more of a guy that would maybe have high upside as a one or two potential in this draft. He's one of those guys. Um, but I don't see that really uh, fulfilling in Memphis. Um, so I was I was kind of against this pick. Um, I liked the idea of Ron Holland and his defensive ability. And I think he can also be a good rebounder, and you can run some lineups with Triple J at the five and Holland at the four. That'd be incredible defensively. I thought maybe Reed Shepard as a set-up guy uh, for Desmond Bean. Um, and would Walter get running time? Like, how does he fit next to Desmond Bean and Marcus Smart, who seem like they're going to both be there for the next two seasons at the minimum? Um, next up at eight, we had the Rockets taking T. John Salon here um, from uh, Trollet in France, um, or Trollet, um, and another French prospect, basically. And I, I think Salon in the top 10 is a little rich, and I think it's more of like the, oh, what could he be at the NBA level? Uh, he's 6'9", he could be a stretch four, he's got length. Um, that's obviously very appealing, and he's performing fairly well over there. I just don't know if Houston's a good fit for what they're trying to build defensively. And do they want to develop Salon, who could be fine getting 8 to 12 minutes a night, and they developed Shangun very well. But Shangun had more runtime basically in year one, year two. Um, they already have basically their franchise front court, they think, in Jabari Smith and Shangun. And is Cam Whitmore the franchise three? Is Jalen Green the franchise two? Is Amen Thompson the franchise one? I don't know what Salon would be specifically because I think he does need to play with a um, high volume playmaking point guard and maybe that's a men Thompson and maybe this ends up working out I think I just like a couple guys behind him a little bit better um, like Reed Shepard like um, Ron Holland and if they were wanting to go like a big man route which someone could be I think I like Filipowski I think I like Eve Misi I like Tyler Smith a ton out of the G League Ignite, and he's kind of creeping into my top 10 right now. Um, and I know he's not in the lottery in this mock, but I think he will end up being a lottery pick because he's somebody that can space the floor, can guard multiple positions, and is still young and raw as a prospect. So I think he'll develop into a good player. So going to the OKC Thunder 9, they take Kyle Filipowski. Obviously, I like them taking a big. They desperately need to take just not a guard in this draft. I, I feel like I feel like they need to take either some type of like uh, high upside versatility wing um, or a big, and that could be T. John Salon, but I like Filipowski because he's been a good um, shooter this year for Duke. Obviously, like he'll be playing in some big time games, um, which he has been all year for Duke. He could have been a first rounder last year, uh, probably a top 20-ish pick. Now this year, it's looking like he's playing good enough to be in a lottery pick because he's really improved his three-point shooting, going from 50, or excuse me, 28% as a freshman to 35% as a sophomore, averaging 17 points, eight rebounds, and just under three assists this year for the Duke Blue Devils. Um, he's seven foot but I feel like he plays a little bit smaller than that. And I wonder he'll be a tweener at the NBA level, but I think he'll be strong enough where he'll be fine um, as a good backup big in the NBA for sure as a high upside offensive guy. Um, so I like that pick for the Thunder at nine. I have no gripes with Filipowski going in the top 10. Uh, Atlanta getting Ron Holland at 10. I mean, this is a great pick. There's some picks that I disagree with um, earlier, which means there's going to be some picks that I'm going to love with guys falling. And Ron Holland at 10, I think is a great pickup. He's been very inconsistent this year. The three-point shot is not there, but the defensive upside, the inside scoring, I'm, I would get excited about this. I know it would be tough, but with Jalen Johnson being a good three-point shooter, and if you have him out there with like Trey Young, we'll see if it's DeJounte Murray, I think you'll be okay with him as a non-shooter. Now, their centers in Clint Capella and Yoko Kungwu aren't shooters either, um, so maybe he'd be obviously as, as a bench guy going forward to start um, his career for the Atlanta Hawks if he were to get drafted by them. But I think he's just somebody that has like star defensive potential and star like, I think he has star scoring potential still. I do. He just needs to work on his three-point shot and his tunnel vision, which I, I still think it's fine, though. I don't think it's like a lost cause in either of those aspects of that game, and that's something where NBA coaching and development could get him right. And he's maybe somebody that could be on like a Jalen Johnson career trajectory, but I think further along as well. Like he might not show anything his rookie year, might show some flashes in year two if there's more playing time, but in year three, this guy could be shown like, all right, this was a steal at number 10. So the, the mock is basically, the rest of the mock is on the screen on YouTube, uh, just because they don't go through each pick specifically anymore. So Donovan Klingon to the Thunder at 11. Uh, so they go up, double up with big men in this draft, getting uh, Filipowski and Klingon. I think I'm fine with just one of them. I think if you were going to go Filipowski, I like the idea of Ryan Dunn here instead of Donovan Klingon, just because Ryan Dunn is the best defender in this draft. He's probably going to be college basketball's defensive player of the year. Um, he has a lot of weaknesses similar to Ron Holland. Um, he's definitely not as good of a scorer as Holland, and Dunn is a sophomore coming out of Virginia. So he's a little bit older. He's not as good of a scorer, um, but he's somebody that's still a good slasher. He's physical inside. He's a good rebounder. He's efficient at the rim. 
but he can't shoot for shit. The dude is not a good three-point shooter. He's not a good free throw shooter, but his defense is off the freaking charts, man. Uh, this year, he's averaging 1.4 steals and 2.3 blocks for the Virginia Cavaliers. He, Like I just said, he's going to probably win the best uh, collegiate defensive award um, in the country this season, and I think that should warrant a lottery pick, and I think if the Thunder have two here, I would opt for Ryan Dunn, and there could be some fun second unit lineups defensively. If they say maybe they ended up with Klingon instead of or they ended up with Klingon and Dunn instead of Filipowski, and you can have Klingon out there in the second unit, you can have Kaysom Wallace in the second unit, you can have uh, Ryan Dunn in the second unit, and that could get really fun uh, defensively and still have some offensive upside as well. Uh, so they have Chicago Bulls taking um, Reed Shepard at number 12. I don't hate this pick. I maybe don't love it. Um, I guess Shepard doesn't have a high of upside as some other guys after, but a lot of those guys are maybe point guard based. Figuring out what Stefan Castle is, because who knows, he kind of plays more like a wing at times. And I think I see a little bit of Bruce Brown in him. And Reed Shepard, I think he's get, de definitely going to be like a glue guy, a setup guy. And that's why I thought he'd be perfect on some teams that are like looking to win now next year, like a Memphis. Maybe it's like in Atlanta, um, but Shepard has been very efficient this season. He's shooting 52% from the field, 51% from three, 81% from the line. Probably going to be a good shooter in the, uh, at the NBA level. The thing about him though, um, like it, it was kind of prevalent or you could see it against the LSU uh, Tigers when they lost to them recently um, in the game the other night is basically he kind of gets fizzled out later in the game. He doesn't look to take over um, as much and that could be a problem at the NBA level, but I think it's definitely fine to have him play adjacent to Kobe White. He's 6'3", but I think he plays fine for a 6'3 guy. I don't think he's like that short out there or that like uh, weak. I think he'll be fine defensively. Um, and Chicago is just a weird fit. I don't love it. I don't hate it. I was pretty indifferent about it. Now, a pick I did hate was uh, the Sacramento Kings going for Zach Eady at pick 13. This is way too high. This is way too high for Eady. I would not take Eady in the lottery. I'd probably not take Eady in the top 20. I'm fine with 20 to 30 because um, Eady, I think his, his ceiling is a backup big. Maybe it's like an 8.8 .8 rebound uh, night guy or just never more than like a high-end backup center. And that's fine. That's fine for a first-round pick. I would not take him in the lottery. I know he's got crazy college numbers, 23 points. 12 rebounds, um, shooting 61% from the field. But this dude is playing against kids at times. He's playing against some 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds. He's 7'4", 285. He's like a giant to them. It, it feels like it's probably like a 22-year-old going up against 12-year-olds. It feels like just the size difference. And it's going to catch up to him at the NBA level. I don't love his footwork. I don't love his mobility. Um, and for the Kings at 13, that's too rich. That's too rich for me. I mean, if you were looking at like the Suns at 21, Bucks at 22, Pelicans at 24, Jazz at 26, Wizards at 27. You could talk into, uh, that into me there, but you cannot talk me into taking Edie at 13. That is way too high. Uh, with Ryan Dunn on the board, with Devin Carter defensively, with Dalton, or excuse me, Dalton Connect, Jared McCain, uh, Yee Misi, who I like better, um, Tyler Smith on the board. Yeah, I don't, I don't like that at all. Um, so next up, we have the Pelicans going with Isaiah Collier. I made the joke last time the Pelicans took a point guard with the last pick in the lottery in 2020, did not work out in Kyra Lewis. But Collier, he's been playing through an injury this year, and he has been much better as of late. Um, you can kind of see, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like him coming back from injury, and um, or I guess basically it was the game against Oregon. He had 11 points, 7 points, kind of getting back into rhythm. And then he's been good. The dude is a bowling ball finisher. Uh, he's had 26 points against Stanford, 12 against Washington State, 20 against UCAL, 18 against Stanford, 15 against Utah, and 25 against Colorado. And they're all pretty efficient outside of the Cal game. So I think that like Collier is going to be a good point guard in this league and a good number one. And I think he still has top 10 upside. And I'm glad Gavoni still has him going in the water because I think he should. And my most recent mock item 16th. And I think that was too low. Uh, Stefan Castle, weird prospect, man, weird prospect. He'd probably benefit from staying another year at UConn and being like the main guy next year. Because um, I don't really know what type of mold he is. He's 6'6", but he's extremely, um, I guess, like taller for him uh, for kind of what he is in his size. And I think could guard multiple positions. He can guard ones, twos, threes, and potentially fours. I just don't know if he's ever going to be a lead creator, if he's going to be the lead playmaker. I think he may be better being adjacent to that and being more of a wing um, kind of role player. And I mentioned Bruce Brown before, and I see, I see some Bruce Brown in Stephon Castle's game. So I don't know if you'd be drafting him for your point guard long term, but he has him going to the Raptors there at 15. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with them getting Topic and, and Castle on this draft for sure. I do not like Kevin McCullough to the Heat at 16. Maybe they're just going to completely go that route of just taking these upperclassmen since Tommy Hawkins is working out very well for them. If you're going to, I mean, I guess for Miami, 
Like, if I'm taking a Kansas player, it's going to be uh, Johnny Furphy, who he has later in this draft. He has him 29th. I would probably opt for him specifically, but I don't really love Kevin McCullough to the Heat. Um, he's not been great as of late, and I think, like, him being 23 already, I'm not a huge fan of his game. Um, there are some inefficiencies at the time. There are some lapses on the defensive side of the ball. Um, he is 6'6". He's got good size. I don't think he's just warrant, like, the 16th overall pick. I think he's, like, a fringe first-rounder guy that you look at later in the first. Uh, Devin Carter, Portland, taking at 17. He's not like a true point guard, um, but he's somebody that is going to be an incredible defender. I mentioned how good, I mentioned how good uh, Ryan Dunn was on the defensive side of the ball before. Um, Carter's really good, man. He's an extremely good point of attack defender. He's probably going to work his way into like what Kaysen Wallace did last year. Um, he's very efficient. He's got a nice jumper, and I see a lot of Kaysen Wallace in him as well. Um, I think he's a better defender than Wallace was coming out of Kentucky. And in Portland, they would end up in this with Cody Williams and Devin Carter. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, I think that's a solid draft for them. Uh, the Magic getting Dalton connected 18. If Miami wanted to go the upperclassman route, like... McCullough being a fifth year, Connect being a fifth year, I would opt for Connect. Um, I, I think he's way better of a shot creator. I like his shot selection a little bit more. And I think he can carry himself and being like a second unit leading scorer for a team next year if it's going to be Miami. I've loved the Orlando fit. I, I'm a big fan of Dalton Connect, and I don't think he has a super high ceiling in the NBA by any means, but this dude is a straight bucket. He's going to be an efficient scorer for you off the bench, and he's got size. He plays with toughness. He'll be a fine defender. I'm a fan of Dalton Connect in this draft. Um, and this would be a phenomenal pick for Orlando at 18. Knicks getting Tyler Smith at 19. Love this pick. Tyler Smith has been an efficient um, big man scorer this year for G League Ignite. Terrible situation. No good weed playmaking or point guard play out of there. And he's still been an efficient big man. He can space the floor. And he is projected to be an upside defender at the next level. I love this pick for the Knicks. I honestly think Tyler Smith has a chance to go in the top 10 on draft night. Or at least in the lottery. Uh, the Sixers getting Jared McCain at 20. Uh, Jared McCain is at uh, Duke. Uh, he's one of the best shooters in the country, shooting 40% from three, 45% from the field, 84% from the line. He's taking 5.7 threes a night, shooting 40%. So a lot more impressive than what like Cody Williams is doing at Colorado. And this would be a nice fit for Philly as a nice shooter for them off the bench. I'm sure Milwaukee would love him at 22. I would even hate if my Knicks took him at 19. I, I would be a fan of that. That Knicks pick is via Dallas as well. Um, he has Ryan Dunn, I think a little bit too low going to Phoenix at 21. I would take Dunn borderline lottery. I talked about how good of a defender he was before. Point of attack, off ball, help, inside. He is very good. He's 6'8". He could probably guard everybody, but maybe like your Joel Embiid centers, your physical fives. And I think this would be an absolute steal for Phoenix. And maybe I'm falling in love with this style of play too much. And maybe uh, he's just not going to ever be a shooter at the next level. And it's going to be tough to watch. But I'm a big Ryan Dunn fan. I am. Just because of the defense. Bucks taking Yves Misi here. I think this is kind of low. Misi's been kind of on a tear a little bit um, in conference play. And with Brooke Lopez getting older, this is a good pick. Yeah, Misi's last like, couple games, 25, 11, 6, 17, 21, 12, 13, and 13. Good efficiency. Your typical like one-dimension offensive guy, like rim runner, um, pick and roll guy, alley-oop guy, like one of those, like Clint Capella, I think will be a, a very common comp for him. And he is good enough to be a starting center in the league. And 22 for the Bucks, good pick. Uh, you got Bobby Clinton to the Knicks there at 23. I'm fine with the Knicks if they were to make two first um, round picks, which I doubt they do. They'll probably trade this pick for a future first. Um, I, I'm cool with the project playing Clipman, who I think is similar to Smith, has high upside as a stretch four, um, can be a, um, a good defender as well, um, and just drafting guys with size, uh, basically, um, with this pick here. Um, high upside. He's playing in the NBL right now for uh, uh, for Carnes, Karens. Um, and then uh, 24th, we got the Pelicans taking Kalel Ware out of Indiana. Um, what could separate Ware from maybe Yves Misi um, is his four spacing ability, shooting 43% on the year um, on 1.3 attempts. So it's not great. I actually randomly just popped in my head. I feel like DeAndre Aiden was somewhat of a shooter at Arizona. And it was not on many attempts. Yeah, 34% from three on one attempt. I don't know why that reminded me of that. Um, but Kalel Ware kind of has flashed some four spacing ability. Um, he... Seems like he makes some kind of dumb plays with the ball in his hands. He seems to do too much at times. And obviously that will scale back. And the Pelicans landing, um, getting like a big in Kalel Ware, huge. Isaiah Collier and Kalel Ware in the draft would be very fun going forward. Uh, Nuggets getting Ethan Amansa at 25. I like this as well. Beautiful touch around the rim. We'll see how his defense uh, will eventually go, but he's a physical guy. And with Zeke Naji maybe not working out too much 
on that extension. This would be a nice first round pick, and Denver seems to draft very well, and I'd be a fan of that pick. I did not like the Trayvon Brazil pick to the Jazz at 26. Uh, I think he was like a first round guy. He was a top 30 guy for me preseason. I don't think so anymore. Um, he's a little bit undersized. He's like a tweener guy. He's like, well, he's 6'9. Is he a three? Is he a four? He's not going to be a five at the NBA level. The jumper has been very inconsistent this season and has definitely taken a step back in his, like, I guess, um, real junior year, technical sophomore year. Um, I, I'm just not a fan of Brazil. I would not take him in the first round. Um, I don't even think like Utah um, would like him that much. Uh, so we have the Wizards at 27. They take DJ Wagner, also a guy that probably would benefit staying at Kentucky this year. And the dude is averaging 10 points, three and a half assists, shooting 41% from the field, 27% from three, 73% from the line. The flashes are there. They are. And people will probably still talk themselves into liking him over Dillingham. I just don't see it. Um, he's going to take some time to develop, probably as a, as a point guard in the NBA level. But you know what? That would be a good fit um, in Washington where he can maybe learn behind it's Tyus Jones or somebody like that. Learn to be a facilitator. Just his job. Set up Denny. Set up a wall and set up uh, Reese Asher if they do draft him. Uh, Cavs getting Juan Nunez at 28. I'm not going to just kind of talk about Juan Nunez, Nunez too much um, just because I haven't really watched a ton of him. He's never been really on my radar. But now seeing him mocked in the first round, going to watch a little bit more of him. Uh, seems like he's out of Germany. Do I like the Cavs taking a point guard? Um, I don't mind it, but with Garland and Craig Porter Jr., seems like a depth pick there. I would maybe opt for a backup big um, with some of these other guys on the board that I would potentially look at. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I would probably take like Tyler Kolak over Nunez. Uh, but like I said, I don't want to be inconsiderate. I don't really know much about Juan Nunez, so I'm not going to act like I do. Johnny Furphy out of Kansas. Uh, this dude... I don't know, man. Everyone thought he was a 2025 guy, but he's been killing it in tournament play. And by killing it, I mean, just like, it's been like a five game stretch, it seems like. No, no, it's definitely been more than that. So it dates back to middle of January. Um, had a good game against Oklahoma State, stunk against West Virginia, um, played well against Cincy, Iowa State, Oklahoma State. The Houston game is really where people kind of fell in love with him. Struggled against Kansas State um, and Baylor, played well against Tech and Oklahoma. He could be like similar to like a Filipowski last year, like, you know, stay another year at Kansas. You could, or if you go in the draft, you may be a top 20 guy, stay at Kansas, you could be a top 10 guy, something like that. Um, Tyler Kolek to the Celtics at 30. Love this pick. I'm a big Tyler Kolek guy. I think he should go in the first round. His court vision is incredible. Uh, he's 6'3". He's not super fast. If you want to compare him to like a Peyton Pritchard, maybe, but he's a good three-point shooter, phenomenal playmaker, um, and he could definitely fight for Peyton Pritchard as the backup point guard going forward and be the third string point guard for them next year. Uh, they have Melvin Ajinka going to the Jazz at 31. Also like Nunez, I don't know too much about, so I'm not going to act like I do. And uh, Keyshawn George out of Miami at 32. Not a fan of him now. I know scouts, at least like, uh, it seems like when like some like writers will talk, like when they talk to scouts, see George as a nice project play, good three and D guy down the line. That's basically the reason for him in the first round. Um, I kind of see it. I kind of don't. He has him at 32. I probably could see an early second rounder for sure. If you think he has that three and D upside. So yeah, I kind of wanted to go more in depth talking like kind of unfiltered about this mock draft because Jonathan Gavoni is like the top draft guy out there. Um, it used to be, uh, Mike Schmitz who ended up becoming a, um, I think like head scout or assistant GM with the Portland Trailblazers, which is super cool. Uh, so Gavoni's kind of the number one guys up there with like Jonathan Wasserman or Bleacher Report, Sam Bassini over there at the Athletic. So definitely take into his opinion a ton because he's talking to scouts. He's traveling to like Germany and Africa and Australia to watch these games in person. Um, so he obviously knows a lot more than me. So it's cool to like kind of read his thoughts and get into it and dig deep. If you guys like these and you want to see me react to like whenever Bleacher Report drops a mock, whenever The Athletic drops a mock, and they just did too. So you can let me know by dropping a thumbs up and I definitely will. Um, so yeah, thank you guys all for watching and listening. Um, if you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I would appreciate you dropping a rating and review over there. And um, it, it would really mean a lot to me. And hit that subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And let me know what you guys think in the comments. And I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Peace.